Okay, thank you very much. Thank you, Pau, also, um, uh, for giving me the, the floor. Uh, and thank you for inviting me to say a few words about the value of research and development and technology cooperation within the International Energy Agency. Actually, I'm just on leaving all this kind of work. I'm soon retired uh, in a few uh, weeks, actually. Uh, I ended my mandate as chairman of the Committee on Energy Research and Technology at the IEA uh, in December, but of course it's all is fresh still, so I feel very comfortable to speak about the beauty and the success of the IEA. Um, let me first give you a short, short overview on the International Energy Agency. When I say IEA, it means the International Energy Agency, which has the headquarters in Paris. The IEA was created in 1974 as a reaction of the, on the, um, o of the OECD members, a reaction to the oil shock at that time. Um, major oil producing countries had dramatically raised the oil price in the hope to profit from the OPEC monopoly. Uh, this, of course, encouraged immediately the OECD members to enforce their cooperation. Under the management of the uh, newly created IEA, oil reserves were installed in each member country and the oil market observation was professionalized. With these measures, uh, the free market mechanism could be reinstalled in relatively short time. Now, uh, while creating the IEA, it was recognized that the dependency from fossil fuels should be limited by all means, and therefore a system of uh, research and development and technology collaboration in the areas of energy efficiency and renewable energies was implemented. Various collaborative programs were started, and today the IEA is a well-established and effective instrument for such international collaboration. Today, this collaboration on uh, research and development and energy technology embraces more than 1,300 research projects with around 6,000 scientists and experts involved. Nearly 500 government agencies, research organizations, universities, energy companies and consultants have signed agreements for this cooperation. The IEA is legally bound with an umbrella agreement which is called the Agreement on an International Energy Program. And this was signed by 28 members in 1974, um, I mean 28 uh, OECD member countries. Under this umbrella agreement, it is a um, sub-agreement called IEA Framework for International Energy Technology Cooperation that regulates the collaborative R&D and technology collaboration. The IEA Secretariat in Paris, with around 200 employees, coordinates the activities. Specifically in charge for energy technology is the Directorate of Sustainable Energy Policy and Technology, STP. They coordinate the energy technology network and they produce well-known publications such as the yearly energy technology perspectives or uh, a number of uh, technology roadmaps. This directorate is supported by the Office of Global Energy Policy, which is in charge of facilitating partnership with non-member countries. Non-member means non-OECD countries, and uh, of course today OECD is not anymore the world market, OECD is just uh, a fraction of the world market and uh, the cooperation of IEA with uh, BRICS countries, uh, Brazil, uh, Russia, India, China and so on. 
South Africa, these big uh, energy consuming countries, this becomes very, very important. Now the IEA is accompanied by various committees uh, to where each IEA member country sends its delegates. The largest of them is the Committee on Energy Research and Technology, um, which I was chairing for six years. It overlooks the activities of the Energy Technology Network and guides the Secretariat in its decisions for publications. There are various subcommittees, we call them working parties or expert groups, um, supporting the work of the CERT. And also in these working parties and, and expert groups, each member country is allowed and encouraged to send a delegate. The hands-on work, the real hands-on work is done in the programs that are created under the IEA framework. Their name, we call them implementing agreements. If you see the show, the just IEA, that means implementing agreement. And there are uh, today over 40 of them. The implementing agreements are indeed the core of the IEA's International Energy Technology Cooperation Program. Just to give you a short overview here, um, this is not the uh, uh, organic, uh, organogram of, of the IEA as such, it's just uh, the organogram of the technology-oriented parts of the IEA. You have a lot of other things at IEA, such as um, um, uh, fossil fuels, uh, data uh, gathering, um, observation of the oil market, and all that things. Uh, so that's just technology oriented. You have the IEA governing board, which is um, the, the top decision making board. Uh, then you have this committee on energy research and technology, which overlooks all uh, technology and R&D um, work. And you see uh, you have these various implementing agreements um, who are uh, who are um, actually th those who do the hands-on work. In between the third and the implementer agreements, you have these four uh, working parties. Um, one for fusion power, um, it's not called working but the coordination committee. Then uh, one for all what happens with fossil fuels, one which is uh, concentrating on renewables, and one which is concentrating on energy efficiency, it's called the end-use working party. Uh, um, so th we group the 40 implementary agreements into these four areas and it can be uh, overviewed and supported by these working parties. You have the R&D Priority Expert Group, that's a special group that checks where do, do we have um, still missing uh, um, research um, happening and trying to motivate countries to create new implement agreements or to organize uh, huge international um, workshops. Uh, we have, of course, also industry um, participating in the implement agreements as sponsors or as members, and non-member countries also are allowed to to participate actively uh, with a lot of rights um, in the implementary agreements. And of course, we have the IA Secretariat supporting all that, and we have the member countries with their delegates supporting all that. Now, shortly talking about the framework for international energy technology cooperation within the IEA. Uh, just to, 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 to say again, the IEA is an organization of the OECD. And uh, this legal framework um, of the IEA, uh, this was actually adopted in 2003, and it, it gives uh, uh, um, a balance, it offers a balance between, uh, between uh, particular interest of the, of the researchers within the implementary agreements and the interest of the IEA as a whole. Um, so I, it has shown to be and proven to be a very viable instrument for stability in international collaborative work. 
And I'm strongly convinced that this is due to the appropriate balance that we have found between particular uh, and common interests. Uh, in detail, to say each collaborative program, uh, um, each implementer agreement is to a wide extent autonomous in its choice of activities and its decisions for collaborative R&D work. And on the same time, by uh, delivering technology data, knowledge and competence to the IEA as a whole, an implementing agreement serves the interests of the, of the IEA. And such by actively serving a greater vision in line with the objectives of the IEA, the visibility of each implementing agreement is amplified. Um, and also uh, embedded in the IEA, the implementing agreement gains in international recognition and funds are easier obtained. So there's really a win-win uh, situation between those who come together to make research and, and technology uh, development together and the interest of the OECD uh, and the wider community in the world with, uh, uh, with the IEA. Um, so this balance has proven to be quite rightly uh, um, decided. Now, in contrast to the political scene, the scientific collaboration has strong advantages. Let me just mention three indicators. Scientists tend to be very generous in disclosing their knowledge independently of the geographic place. And the interest and focus of scientists is not bound to international borders, and scientists naturally tend to be analytical and to serve common interests. Now you, you, are, uh, you, you of course hear when I say that, that I'm a scientific thinking person. So, <laughs> In contrast, because in contrast to this, I observe that meetings on policy are more of defensive character. Particular interests of international importance are in the front, even if the, um, if the meeting is dedicated to international collaboration. So it's always that I had to, to, to live that myself all, uh, very often uh, with scientists that the meetings were very cooperative, very easy in a way, um, not bound to national interests, and with policy makers, the na national importance was always in the front. Now it is my, that's why I say it is my conviction that the world of science will continue to play a decisive role for the world peace. Collaborative R&D uh, offers the opportunity to delegates of various nations from different corners of the world to approach each other in a constructive and proactive attitude. And it can help to lessen the defensive attitude of policymakers when discussing international regulations. We all are facing tremendous challenges, independent from any, which corner we, we come from or we live. Some parts of the world still suffer from energy poverty, while others have no shame to waste energy. The market animates an attitude of consumerism that is in direct contrast to international solidarity. The result of our greedy nature is well known. If we continue like this, the world average temperature will increase by 6 degrees C and the risk of, fur of further war for resources will be very high. With the liberalized trade, the individual effort of a single country tends to be in vain if it is not supported by international agreement. Therefore, it is urgent time to enhance the harmonization of support schemes and technology standards. And it is, ur it is urgent time to create irrevocable international agreements on energy policy. Now, why do I uh, say irrevocable? Irrevocable agreements. Simply because affordable investments never happen in unstable conditions. There is plenty money available, if only we can offer predictable conditions. 
According to the calculation of the IEA, some trillion dollars are now immediately needed to bend the course of climate change from 6 degrees C to 2 degrees C increase. This can only happen if the international collaboration on energy technology and policy is expanded from OECD to all important economies and if it includes the world of business and finance. Now, uh, buildings uh, play a particular role. Um, we talk now in this conference about buildings. And uh, also within the IEA, uh, buildings are on, of very high importance. According to the World Energy Outlook and the energy technology perspectives of the IEA, the building sector will be key for, the health, for a healthy future. Residential and commercial buildings account for over 30% of global energy use. And presently, the average annual rate of energy demand growth for buildings is 1%. And we know that with reasonable investment costs, this could be reduced to 0.4%. With over 40% of affordable potential reduction of energy use till 2035, the building sector is a promising clean investment opportunity. This potential of 40% is the highest of all sectors. It compares with industry uh, with a little bit more than 20%, transport also a little bit more than 20%, and the power sector with less than 10%. So buildings with 40% of affordable potential reduction of energy use is really very, very important. With rising incomes and growing urbanization in China, India, Latin America, and ASEAN countries, the worldwide demand for cooling will grow over average. Our d and in efficiency, uh, in, sorry, our d and in efficient cooling becomes vital. This type of research should be accelerated mainly in emerging countries. Therefore, the cooperation between OECD and non-OECD countries should be enhanced. It is a fact that one of the primary individual's needs is a comfortable home. It's natural. However, buildings' occupancy behavior is not well analyzed. There is room for more social research. Now, with these few words, I'm not an expert. I leave the floor now to experts. Uh, let me give you the, the website of the IEA here, um, where you find a lot of details on the organization and what all has been done and all the implement agreements and so on. So I, I um, thank you very much for listening, and I give the floor back, I think, to Pau. Thank you very much.